This video is brought to you by Nebula Classes. Get great classes from your favorite creators by going to nebulaclasses.com slash Z or clicking the link in my description. We have a terrible decision to make. It is an uncertain decision and we don't have a lot of time. Did you ever just fixate on something small? You know, you, you see a post or watch an episode of something and it's just so profoundly fascinating that you just can't stop thinking about it and it just sits in your brain and haunts you. <laughs> this episode of Doctor Who has been that for me for years. I go to sleep and it appears in my dreams. I'm asked in job interviews to talk about a time when I had to deal with a difficult situation and I find myself thinking about this episode. It's been with me for almost a decade now. I think the only way to exercise it from my brain is to talk about it and unpack it. I'm not intending for this to be like a super long video. I often feel like when I'm doing a video on a given subject, there's this pressure to encapsulate every argument and experience and example of some broad reaching social phenomenon. You know, I've got to make the video on geek as an identity or harassment in fan communities or death of the author. Or if I'm analyzing a text, it's taking it apart, comparing and contrasting it to every piece of media that tries to do something similar. Like with Dear Evan Hansen, it wasn't just about the movie, but all movie musicals and how to adapt them and how it compares to like the last five years and into the woods. But okay, so the next video I'm planning is going to be pretty research intensive and I need time to work on it. And also sometimes the things I'm interested in aren't these all encompassing concepts. Sometimes it's a single episode of a half century old family sci-fi show that has wormed its way into my brain like a cybernetic parasite and just won't let go. It was 2011. First time Doctor Who writer Peter Harness wanted to tell a story. He wanted to tell a story about a moral dilemma, one that the eponymous doctor didn't have a hand in resolving. He wanted to put humanity in the driver's seat to force us to make the hard choices and live with the consequences. And he wanted the episode to be thrilling, full of Hinchcliffian scares, to be intense and emotional. It took a few years for the episode to come out, apparently significantly changed from its original concept. It even featured a different doctor than it was originally written for, but it eventually aired in 2014 featuring Peter Capaldi and Jenna Coleman as the 12th doctor and his companion, Clara. And uh, it ended up being a weird, vaguely anti-abortion metaphor. This haunts me all, this haunts me so much. In this video, I want to do a couple things. I just want to dive into and unpack this episode, what it says and what happened here and how this ended up becoming an episode of Doctor Who. It's kind of a weird one, so I hope you won't mind coming on this short ride with me. But before I start summing up with what happens in the episode, I want to get a couple of things out of the way. First and foremost, interpretations are subjective. My intent when I do any kind of analysis is never to claim that I've discovered the one true meaning of a text, that I'm right and everyone else whose interpretations differ is wrong. We can watch the same episode and come out of it with wildly different conclusions. We can see the same themes and ideas in a piece of media and disagree on what they're trying to say about those themes, and that's all fine. Criticism is never intended to be one definitive statement, it's a conversation. If you disagree with any of my readings here, that is fine, and I'm not saying you're wrong. Second of all, and this should go without saying, but I thought it worth mentioning anyway, I have no personal beef with the writer of this episode or anyone else who had a hand in its creation. I do have a personal beef with Stephen Moffat, but that's irrelevant to this particular episode. It's quite possible that the interpretation I'm about to lay out here wasn't something that was intended by the writer Peter Harness or even something that crossed his mind. I don't know how this episode ended up being what it is, and I am not accusing him of being pro-forced birth or a bad guy or anything of that regard. I think it was a bad episode, but you know, I thought his other episodes since then were decent. I liked the pyramid at the end of the world well enough, for instance. I'm here to talk about the episode and the text, not about its creator. Thirdly, and this is related, I wasn't able to verify this myself, but I found several secondhand sources claiming the writer Peter Harness said he didn't intend for the episode to be a metaphor about abortion, and provided this is a real quote, I'm willing to believe him. At the same time, y'all know my perspective on authorial intent, I've done a whole video on it, 
I mean, really, I've done multiple videos on it. I think taking into account what a creator was trying to say and how well they performed at saying it is absolutely relevant. At the same time, I think these similarities exist regardless of whether they were intentional. The author created the text, but to some extent, the text still stands as its own work and can still communicate even unintentional themes and messaging. Not to mention the fact that even beyond one person's writing, the work of multiple people go into creating any kind of episode, and so it pulls from a variety of different influences that may not have been intentional from any one person. If you want to hear my more detailed thoughts on the subject, I have two videos up that deal with it. With all that said, Let's dig into that time Doctor Who did a pro-life episode. Kill the Moon, Series 8's seventh episode of Doctor Who, aired in late 2014 and was set a little over 30 years into the future. If anyone is unfamiliar with Doctor Who, it's a long-standing British sci-fi show about a time-traveling alien who takes 20-year-old English women into the longest first dates of their lives. For context in terms of how it fits into the character's larger arcs, Clara has been traveling with the Doctor for a good while now. The show has always had with it this conflicting theme of, you know, the Doctor is this basically immoral guy with godlike powers and the ability to save the world, what's his responsibility with this power? He often has to make large, difficult choices on the behalf of humanity, some of which go uninterrogated by the text, and many which don't. And the show often asks us, does he really have this right? And if he does, is he making the right choices with it? Clara is, in many ways, the character whose arc most closely mirrors the Doctor's. Much of her narrative centers around becoming much more reckless, more like this alien she met. She's a human who's been put into a position of immense power over other humans by virtue of her relationship with the Doctor. She's someone who often has to make hard choices that will have a profound effect on the world. At the same time, the power differential between these two, particularly between her and Matt Smith's Doctor, has been a long-standing theme. There are numerous scenes where she is infuriated by the fact that he's chosen to withhold information from her or make decisions on her behalf. And in many ways, Kill the Moon is where these conflicting themes really come to a head. Who gets to make choices on the behalf of humanity? Who bears the consequences of these choices? Who are we when put into a position with that kind of power? So the episode begins with the moral dilemma itself. An innocent life versus the future of all mankind. We have 45 minutes to decide. Clara asks the world to collectively decide together what to do, and then we get our context. The doctor has hurt one of Clara's students, made her feel small and insignificant, and he's taking her on a trip to the moon to make up for it. When they get there, they meet this military-esque astronaut woman with nukes who seems ready to kill all of them if they intervene with what she's doing. I'm not gonna give you another chance. Oh. Well, you're just gonna have to shoot us then. Shoot the little girl first. The doctor is kind of a dick, passes his intimidation check, and they get all caught up with what's happening. Moon's fucked up, and nobody knows why. It's gaining weight and fucking up the gravity, meaning we're getting disappearances, natural disasters, and more. Something happened up here, nobody knows what. That's when the trouble began back on Earth. Not only that, but the moon is apparently breaking apart, and that's going to cause some serious damage to humanity. The scientist woman, Lundvik, is there to blow up the moon so that it'll stop being dangerous. We see some scares, there's a little mystery, we get some quips. Throughout this, the Doctor continues to be kind of condescending to the rest of the characters, all of whom are women. This is important, I promise, I'm not just trying to cancel the Doctor or whatever. Eventually, the characters stumble upon the truth. The moon is an egg, and a living creature is growing inside, and soon it's going to hatch. The moon isn't breaking apart, the moon is hatching. The moon's an egg. So I think that that is utterly beautiful. How do we kill it? As the characters are debating what to do next, the doctor leaves. He says, It's your moon, womankind. It's your choice. Lundvik is like, okay, well, if the moon breaks apart, there's a very large chance that it will kill everyone on Earth. For what it's worth, the story doesn't view or care about this through the basic lens of blowing up the moon with nukes would itself be very dangerous to humanity and probably mess with the natural world. The science of that isn't something the show portrays or is concerned about, so it doesn't really factor into the morality of any of this. As far as the show is concerned, blowing up the egg would just make it back into the regular moon. 
Lundvik is very committed to the decision to kill the moon, as it were. There's also a line that she doesn't have kids, so you know she's an unfeeling bitch. You might have some very difficult conversations to have with your kids. I don't have any kids. Meanwhile, Clara, who wants to have kids one day, as well as her student Courtney, are very opposed to this, and the language they use is... Ugh. Lines like, you can't blame a baby for kicking, we can't kill a baby, all of those. It'll never feel the sun on its back. The gravity of the little dead baby will pull all the pieces back together again. This is a life. I mean, this must be the biggest life in the universe. It's not even been born. It is killing people. It is destroying the Earth. You cannot blame a baby for kicking. It's an exo-parasite. I'm gonna have to be a lot more certain than that if I'm gonna kill a baby. Finally, the women reach a decision. They'll let humanity vote. Their moon, their choice. Which, you know, sure, fair. They explain the situation and let humans vote on it by turning their lights on or off. It seems like we're gearing up for a wholesome moment. We gave humanity the right to choose. They're going to preserve the life of this moon fetus, even if it hatching might mean the destruction of humanity. Unborn life is precious, etc., etc. But then something interesting happens. Humanity pretty much universally votes to blow up the moon creature. Lundvik is ready to go through with the decision. But at the last minute, Clara pushes her aside and disables the nukes. A big aborted flashes on the screen, probably unintentional, but lol and the doctor comes back and whisks them back to Earth to watch the hatching. One, two, three, into the top. What's happening? Let's go and have a look, shall we? This part is incredible. So the moon egg hatches, it looks like a little dragon or something, and then it immediately lays another egg, the exact same size as the previous moon and in the exact same space, and then flies off into the distance. So there were no consequences for any of that. This was unambiguously the right decision to make, and we can all rejoice in the fact that humanity was stupid and didn't know what they were doing, and claw knew best. Then, though, the doctor reveals that he knew the entire time what was going to happen. He knew that humanity was going to see something that, for once, it didn't want to destroy, and that this event, choosing to save the moon creature, would end up being the catalyst for humanity's ability to go spacefaring and survive. Essentially, humans made a selfless, empathetic choice, and it was this specific event that allowed humanity to thrive for the rest of time. Did you know? You made your decision. Humanity made its choice. No, we ignored humanity. Well, there you go. The kind starts creeping off into the stars, to the very edges of the universe. And it does all that because one day in the year 2049, when it had stopped thinking about going to the stars, something occurred that made it look up. And it saw something beautiful, something wonderful that for once it didn't want to destroy. The whole course of history was changed. He praises Clara and Courtney for making the right choice. Lundvik thanks Clara for saving her from herself. Thank you. Thank you for stopping me. They ditch Lundvik on the beach with no way of getting home. Yeah, fuck you, serves you right for trying to save humanity, you childless harpy. And they take Clara's student Courtney back to school, where she feels fulfilled and important again. Okay, Captain. Well, you've got a whole new space program to get together. NASA is, uh, that way. About two and a half thousand miles. You still got your vortex manipulators. I'll give you a run home. This, then, is where Clara tells the doctor the fuck off. She says she felt condescended to and abandoned by him using the decision to test her, that he should have just stayed and helped, and that it's just as much his Earth as everybody else's. It was patronizing. That was you. Pat Ingalls on the back saying, well, you're big enough to go to the shops by yourself now. Go on, toddle along. Oh, that was me allowing you to make a choice about your own future. That was me respecting you. Oh my god, really? Was it? Yeah, well, respected is not how I feel. I nearly got it wrong. That was you. My friend making me scared. You make us your friend, then that is your moon too, and you can damn well help us when we need it. I was helping. What, by clearing off? Yes. Yeah, well, clear off! She calls him patronizing, and in an honestly pretty good monologue, she, at least temporarily, breaks off her relationship with him. We see her looking out at the moon back in the present day, and the episode ends with her reflecting on everything that just happened. Oh god, okay, so there's so much here. I saw some people who watched this episode say they didn't notice any potential parallels to how abortion gets talked about, and honestly, 
I have trouble understanding that. Of course, it's not a one-to-one -one allegory. For starters, the moon egg is not something being carried in the bodies of humans. It's an autonomous creature rather than something created by humans that can only survive through the continued consent of a person whose body it uses. There's also an element of uncertainty in the episode that you don't necessarily get when we're talking about abortion. In that case, generally we know what will happen. In Kill the Moon, we don't know for sure whether this creature being born will kill humanity, but we know it has the potential to. We have to make our decision with only partial knowledge. So the egg dilemma doesn't scale in the exact same perfect way as an actual human being making a decision about their own body would. I mean, if it was the exact same situation, it wouldn't be an allegory. At the same time, when I watch this episode, so many pieces of dialogue feel as though they are very explicitly written to elicit that discussion. I mean, the doctor says the phrase, your moon, your choice to them. It's your moon, womankind. It's your choice. It is literally about whether to end the life of an unborn creature because it is hazardous to the lives and health of humanity. We get lines about how we can't kill a baby and it's not the baby's fault its birth might be dangerous to humans. We get dialogue about whether we should consider it a baby or a parasite, a line I've seen repeatedly toted out in abortion debates. There's this whole theme about saving humanity from itself, how by ending the life of this unborn creature, it would have been making a permanent decision that it regretted. We have Lundvik saying, I was wrong to think I should have made this decision. Thank you for taking it out of my hands. Thank you. Thank you for stopping me. It all feels so obviously on the nose that I struggled to see how you could watch the episode and not pick up on it. Not only that, but for an episode that is supposedly simply about humanity and who gets to make decisions and moral dilemmas, gender is a significant theme in the story. The fact that only women are left to make this choice feels very deliberate. The fact that schoolteacher Clara wants children and Lundvik never had any is another fact that is meant to highlight Lundvik as cold and callous and Clara as motherly and considerate. There are several lines explicitly referencing the characters' genders. The doctor describes the choice as being up to womankind. There's a line where they very pointedly remark that the president of the United States is now a woman. Who's better qualified? I don't know, the president of America. Oh, take something off his plate. He makes far too many decisions anyway. She. It's your moon. Womankind, it's your choice. Even the moon creature itself is female. Every significant character is a woman, save for the doctor. The fact that the decision is framed as a moral dilemma with gendered language feels very purposeful to me, even if perhaps it wasn't. This is the point then where we look at this episode and we're forced to ask, what was it trying to say? When I decided I wanted to make this video, I did a little bit of reading on other people's thoughts regarding the episode, and I saw mixed things. A lot of people were just upset about the science, you know, this creature laying an egg the exact size of it, and sure, the show about an alien with two hearts flying around the universe in a box that's bigger on the inside isn't scientifically accurate. Okay. But I also saw a lot of discussion as to if Kill the Moon does indeed bear several similarities to abortion, what the episode is trying to say about it. And I've seen two interpretations. The first is that the episode is pro-choice. It places women, specifically a woman who is thinking about having children and has to square that decision with her life plans, firmly in the driver's seat. The doctor excuses himself when asked to make the choice and explicitly references the fact that this is something only womankind gets to decide for themselves. All of humanity is given the choice to weigh in, and at the end of the day, it's an individual woman who gets to make that decision for herself. You know, no matter what everyone is trying to tell Clara to do, that choice ends up being hers to make, and that's valuable. The other interpretation is that this is a pro-forced birth episode. Incidentally, when I was looking this up, I found these, like, Catholic websites praising it for its anti-abortion message, so take from that what you will. The egg creature is likened to an unborn baby multiple times, and everyone who wants to kill the moon is framed as either heartless and cruel or simply blinded by their own fear. Humanity tries to make that decision for themselves, and they are maternalistically overridden by one person who decides it would be morally wrong to do a moon abortion, and that person is framed as unambiguously in the right by the narrative. 
So through this interpretation, the people who want to metaphorically do this late-term abortion for their own health are the bad guys and the person who steps in to save the life of this unborn creature at the potential expense of humanity is the hero. Doing the moon abortion would have been immoral. Not doing it was the right call. I always think it's interesting when people can come out of an episode like this with radically different understandings of what just happened and what it was trying to say, to be honest. And again, all the disclaimers from earlier still apply. But in order to unpack exactly what is happening here, I want to outline three underlying assumptions that the episode brings forth. What I want to argue for here specifically is that even absent of a direct metaphor, all of this episode's core assumptions about humanity are themselves pro-life. So what does this episode believe about what's happening in it? Assumption one, choosing whether or not to kill the egg is a morally significant act and the unborn nature of the moon egg grants it special moral consideration. Hey, so um, I figured this should probably go without saying, but I realized I haven't technically said it. In order to explore what this episode is saying, I am going to have to compare and contrast it to pro-life rhetoric. As a result, there's going to be some nasty stuff coming up. Just be aware of that. Divorced from all these questions of unbornness and bodily autonomy, the actual question Kill the Moon asks us to consider, is it moral to end one life to save billions, is nothing new. It's a moral dilemma that's been posed in science fiction time and time again, and one we often have to square with in the real world too. Stories like the ones who walk away from Amalus end up coming down on a very similar side as Kill the Moon did. Amalus poses a hypothetical world where everyone lives in a wonderful utopia free of concern, but this utopia is predicated on the horrible suffering of one single child, something people know about but mostly choose to not really think about. We're asked to see Amelis as a bad place and the complicity of its citizens as wrong. And indeed, we're asked to consider real-world situations of exploitation, where do our clothes come from, in a very similar light. We are told no, actually, willingly contributing to the suffering of others for our own benefit is generally bad. Conversely, you have narratives that say, yes, ending one life to save many is the moral choice. Classic Star Trek episode City on the Edge of Forever has the characters have to let one human being die because that human being living would have had butterfly effects that led to the deaths of millions. An innocent person had to die to save all those lives, and it's not presented as pretty or good, but it is presented as necessary. Both of these stories tell us different things, and I don't think either message is inherently wrong to present or put out into the world. In both cases, we're asked about questions of innocence. The Amelis child is an innocent and pure, literal child. Keeler from Star Trek is innocent and pure, a pacifist. And likewise, Kill the Moon treats the innocence of the moon egg as a factor worthy of special consideration. This is a creature that has not yet been born and it did not ask to be put in this situation. It's not its fault that it might pose a danger to humanity or that it's being born into a situation where it might not survive. This is not just about ending one life to save many, but ending an innocent one. This isn't even something new to Doctor Who itself. The act of taking a life has been a prominent theme in the show for years now, and honestly too many to name, but especially when it comes to the Daleks, the fascist trash can mecha race that serves as one of the show's primary antagonists. Episodes like Genesis of the Daleks or the first New Who series episode Dalek puts the Doctor in a position where he has to choose if he wants to let the Daleks live be it the entire species or just a single one, even if it means the possibility of Daleks going on to kill or endanger many more people. That was actually the main overarching narrative of New Who for a while. The idea that the Doctor took it upon himself to commit a genocide and kill both Daleks and his species, the Time Lords, in order to protect the universe. The show is no stranger to examining the morality of taking a life and often brings up whether or not someone like the Doctor has the right to do such a thing. Where Kill the Moon Moon differs from those other narratives, though, is in the fact that the Moon's lack of being born frames it as explicitly more innocent and thus more deserving of life than the people around it. We care about the Amelis child because it is a human being and caring about the well-being of human beings is good. We care about Keeler because she is kind and loves and is loved. We care about the Moon Egg, though, largely on the basis that its status as an unborn creature makes it special. The Doctor talks about how we don't yet know what it could be, that it has the potential to become anything, that the great mystery of this creature makes it inherently special. A hundred nuclear bombs set off right where they are. Right on top of a living, vulnerable creature. 
It'll never feel the sun on its back. I mean, this must be the biggest life in the universe. This is not even born. Its life is weighed against the billions of other lives on this Earth, not just on the basis of everyone deserves to live, but on the basis that it not being alive yet makes it particularly important. There is a specific scene where no children girl boss Lundvik is like, hey, what about the actual babies on actual Earth who could die over this? And no one has any real response to her. Oh, you want to talk about babies? You've probably got babies down there now. You want to have babies? What? Yeah. You want that thing to get out? Kill them all? You want today to be the day life on Earth stopped because you couldn't make an unfair decision? The creature's unhatched nature gives it a special kind of innocence and a special kind of moral weight. It is free of sin and full of potential, and thus its life is especially valuable. And like, this is explicitly a pro-life assumption, right? The idea that by virtue of being unborn and thus having not yet substantially sinned, a creature is especially worthy of life, more so than someone who is already alive and is tainted by sin. You've got people like the US's Idaho Senate candidate Scott Herndon directly comparing the procedure to putting an innocent child to death for the crime of its parents or um, ChristianLifeResources.com, which places repeated emphasis on contrasting the innocent child and the sinful, murderous mother. Even if abortion were safer for the mother than childbirth, writes Ghoul with vaguely humanoid features Randy Alcorn, it would still remain fatal for the innocent child. The life of the wicked mother is less important than the innocent child. Or even the common refrain of, what if the baby grew up to cure cancer? They are special not just because they are humans, but because they have potential. That's why the common retort of, okay, well, what if the woman you forced to have children could have cured cancer doesn't really sway these people. This awful cocktail of misogyny and ideology then creates a situation where the health and, in some cases, lives of anyone pregnant are dismissed in favor of that of a pure potential-filled blastocyst. And this is the same rhetoric in its own messy way that this episode displays. The lives of all of humanity are being placed at risk, albeit in a very uncertain way, and our choice to kill the moon or not kill the moon is seen as morally significant. And again, this is all fine and appears in a lot of sci-fi. But the reason its life is worthy of special consideration above the lives of the billions of other people on Earth is not just it is generally good to preserve life, but rather because it has not yet been born and this makes it special. This leads us to the next assumption the episode makes. Assumption 2. Humanity at large does not know what is best for itself. In Kill the Moon, the Doctor leaves Clara, Courtney, and Lundvik with a choice. He's a Time Lord, they're humans. What happens to humans is their decision and something they have to deal with. If we're going to be really on the nose about it, it's the decision of womankind. They extend this out to the rest of the world. They should hear how everyone in the world feels about this and take it into consideration when deciding their next course of action. And when humanity inevitably decides to do the action they need to in order to protect themselves and not this thing they just found out about five minutes ago, Lundvik uses that to finally go ahead and push the button, only to be stopped at the last minute by Clara, and then lectured by the doctor who says that he always knew the right choice and that there would be an outcome where everything would be fine, but he wanted to give humanity a choice, and perhaps an important detail that gets lost in the weird saccharine vibe of the beach scene, humanity made the wrong one. I had faith that you would always make the right choice. What's interesting to me here is this scene where Clara lets the doctor have it. She makes many good points. Abandoning them without giving them all the information they'd need to make an informed decision was unfair, he's acting paternalistic and condescending toward humanity, he had no right to do that. But what's especially notable is that at no point does she challenge the notion that humanity made the wrong choice by voting to kill the moon. In fact, she agrees with it. I nearly made the wrong choice, she tells him. Well, that was me allowing you to make a choice about your own future. That was me respecting you. Oh my god, really, was it? Uh... I nearly didn't press that button. I nearly got it wrong. There's a lot of discussion about what this scene is trying to tell us about the episode. Arguments about whether the Doctor was respecting humanity's autonomy by letting womankind decide. But what often gets lost in these discussions is that the Doctor is not the one responsible for overriding the wishes of humanity here. Clara is. 
She's the one who asks humanity to vote and make a free choice, and then stops Lundvik from pushing the button against all of humanity's wishes. And this is the violation that is not only never narratively challenged in this episode, it's in fact endorsed explicitly. Humanity not only would have been morally wrong to do the moon abortion, it would have been such a morally wrong act that it necessitated one human superseding the will of humanity to prevent it from happening. Thus women on the moon saved the earth from itself. Humanity did not know what was best for itself. It needed someone to essentially save it from itself. With all the talk in this episode about Time Lords versus humans, as well as about gender, it's easy to see Clara as one of the primary stakeholders in this, in the same way the rest of Earth's population is. It's certainly what the episode wants you to think, that all three women have, at minimum, an equal say in what happens to the moon egg. But what Clara is, in the actual narrative of this episode, is much closer to an outside force exerting her will on the people who are the actual stakeholders here. Now, obviously, as I said, this is not a perfect metaphor as far as abortion is concerned. The one notion that doesn't really translate here is bodily autonomy. It's not as if this is like an alien species that requires humanity to survive or something like that. The fact that these humans are not like living on the moon is relevant. But as far as this episode is considered, humanity are still the primary stakeholders as far as the moon dilemma goes. The characters have reason to believe that if it hatches, humanity might die, so simply for being close to the thing, and have no means of survival if this turns out to be true. And with that in mind, I think it's important to mention that Clara has the fewest stakes in the situation compared to anyone else involved. Like, yeah, this is Earth 30 years in the future, and theoretically a much older Clara would have to deal with that, lol JK, I've seen series 9. But besides that, Clara's role as a time traveler means that she can fully exempt herself from any negative consequences that could come from this decision if she so chooses. Compare this to Lundvik, who has lived in the time period in which this takes place for her whole life, who has clearly spent a lot of time training and preparing for this exact purpose, and the people of Earth, who have been dealing with catastrophic events and deaths up until this point, and who would have to directly deal with the possibility of things getting worse Worse if this thing is slow to hatch. If there was anyone who would have the proper context and understanding to make a choice like this, it would be humanity as a whole. And yet, when Clara prevents the moon abortion from happening, we're told very explicitly that she did the right thing here. We're told that over and over again. It's not a real moral dilemma because one choice is very, very clearly the right one as far as the story is concerned, and there are no long-term consequences or complexity that muddies these waters after the fact. The primary stakeholders, the people who have to actually live on the Earth, experience the consequences of the moon egg, are cast as fearful, unreasonable, reasonable, unable to make decisions about their own lives. They need this almost paternalistic teacher figure in Clara to tusk tusk them, stop them from killing the moon, and tell them it's for their own good and they don't know what they really want. And narratively, they don't. <laughs> Lundvik openly acknowledges this. Which is unfortunately very in line with a lot of propaganda about women seeking to end their pregnancies. There's this narrative of women who might think they want this, but it'll actually make them sad and miserable and worsen their lives. There are so many pieces of Christian propaganda where a woman will be stopped from having an abortion in some way, talked out of it for example, and prostrate herself thanking whoever saved her from herself. Or look at this old chick tract of this woman crying and repenting because she regretted what she did so much. They didn't know what was best for them, they were foolish and afraid and unreasonable, and what they wanted to do had to be stopped by any means necessary. Again, the metaphor is imperfect, but we're nonetheless presented with an entire populace of people whose desires morally must be overridden, both for the sake of the moon egg and also for their own. The doctor goes on about how this not only saved the moon baby, but also morally enriched the people of Earth, helped them become a spacefaring race, made them better and happier people. They just couldn't be trusted to make that decision themselves. Thank God someone who knew best made it for them. Which leads me into assumption number three. Having babies is good for your soul. Okay, so 
Focusing in for a sec, the narrative treatment of Lundvik is kind of wild, right? Like, beyond the morals the episode is trying to impart on us, she isn't excessively unreasonable in her desire to blow up the moon baby. Again, the show doesn't care about the science of this. To the best of her knowledge, she's saving the lives of billions of people, including her own, and going along with the free will of the rest of humanity. It's not a pretty thing that she's suggesting doing, and there are certainly arguments to be made against it, but she isn't acting out of any particular cruelty or malice. But the episode fucking hates her, like it absolutely hates her guts. We get scare music on some of her lines, the show goes out of its way to depict her as cold and heartless and cruel, we learn almost nothing about her that's humanizing, whereas the other side characters, like Clara's student Courtney, are treated as warm and valuable people. The Doctor just flat out abandons her in the wilderness in the middle of nowhere, even after she expresses regret, and it's not framed as a particularly bad thing, just a vaguely unflattering send-off. In effect, she very much looks like the conservative portrayal of a heartless, cold, bitchy career woman who is actually miserable that you'd see in the 1970s. It sucks, actually. You might hear this point and argue, wait, she's not supposed to be a representative of the dangers of abortion and she isn't depicted in a sexist way. Absent of any intentional metaphor, you could just say that the scare music indicates simply that she's representative of hawkish military gusto and humanity's tendency to attack what they don't understand. How do we kill it? Why do you want to kill it? It's a little baby. Doctor, how do we kill it? Indeed, Doctor Who has many such characters, the token stooge who responds to any unfamiliar sight with violence and exists to be condemned for this by the Doctor. These characters are common and tend to be both male and female. But this episode is about babies, and I don't just mean this metaphorically, but in a very literal sense. The episode not only frames having babies as good, but as imparting a special kind of empathy and maternal value upon children that the barren and childless do not have. The show makes an explicit point to tell us that Lundvik never had children. We're meant to understand this as a sign of her moral wrongness. She is a cold, uncaring, unmaternal woman and doesn't recognize the inherent beauty and value in the life of the moon baby. Contrast this with Clara, who wants to be a mom and is the moral sweetheart. This babies make you a good person through line even scales up on a planetary level. The literal Earth having a baby, metaphorically, represents the moment it becomes a more empathetic civilization because of the beauty it witnesses. The more a woman wants or has babies as far as the episode is concerned, the kinder and more empathetic she is. This is obviously horseshit. Many cruel, callous, awful women, and men of course as well, are parents. Many wonderful, empathetic, thoughtful women are childless. The episode uses Lundvik's childlessness as shorthand for her coldness, and why? It doesn't correlate with any real truth, so what is Kill the Moon trying to say here? Notably, these other episodes featuring similar character archetypes do not tend to use childlessness as that kind of shorthand for men who are characterized the same way. Uh, for instance, the show never makes a point of asking or telling us whether Jack Robinson, the show's bad Trump expy who wants to kill a bunch of spiders, is a dad or not. It doesn't matter. And this is my hotel, just one hotel, in an incredibly successful chain of hotels, which is just one small part of my business portfolio. It's only relevant in an episode that's both about babies and about gender. The idea that women who don't want or have children are colder, more uncaring, and more callous than women who do is unfortunately still pervasive, and it's something many real-life women have to deal with a lot. A lot of popular media still uses the inability for women to be mothers as shorthand for something else bad about them. I'm resisting the urge to go on a tangent about that one fucking Avengers scene. Back when birth control was first coming onto the scene, a concerted effort was made by religious conservatives to frame women who chose to seek out birth control as selfless and cruel for doing so. 
there isn't really an equivalent men who don't have kids are worse people, at least not on any larger level. It's, it's a very gendered phenomenon. And this really does extend into how abortion is treated. Babies make you a good person and not wanting them is bad is a pro-life message that's used in a variety of ways despite being entirely untrue. And like, Lundvik is the textbook example of a right-wing portrayal of women who get abortions, right? Pro-forced birth propaganda tends to depict three kinds of women who choose abortions. The most sympathetic kind, poor, desperate women manipulated by evil doctors, then irresponsible party girls who just want to sleep around, and then the third kind, the high-power, no-nonsense, cold, callous career woman who has no love in her heart for babies. The cold career woman who loves to kill babies trope appears in all kinds of media from the first Game of Thrones book to this one Turkish series I found doing some reading that depicts a negatively portrayed career woman wake up from her abortion and get upset about being late for a meeting. Even in sympathetic portrayals of women who seek out abortions, you'll often see right-wing lines get repeated that amount to, well, even if you didn't want to be pregnant, this is a wonderful opportunity to grow as a person and make something beautiful out of your life. A friend of mine, Big Joel, has an older video about a Christian TV series with this exact message. Having babies is fulfilling and makes your life worth living even if you die shortly thereafter, and I'll link it because it's worth checking out. I did some reading on old anti-abortion Soviet propaganda a little bit ago, and you'll see lots of depictions of childless women as bitter, lonely, cold, and unhappy, contrasted with joyful, caring, maternal women who are made happier and better people through their having children. And I don't know. When I see a character like Lundvik, I have a really hard time in my head divorcing how she's portrayed from this framing. When they make a point of telling us that she's childless only to directly contrast her with the warm maternal Clara who then has the right to unilaterally override her and everyone else's decisions about the moon egg, it's rough. It once again indicates that even if this episode is not intentionally written to be about abortion, it is about motherhood to some extent, and the assumptions made about motherhood are pretty expressly conservative and can easily be used in service of forced birth. These are, I would argue, kind of the three core assumptions that this episode makes. The egg is special because it is unborn, the choice to kill it is so morally wrong that it is necessary to override it by any means possible, and having babies is an indicator of someone's moral value. Any one of these messages taken on their own might be iffy, but not necessarily come out to something completely abhorrent. All kinds of media I love includes messages that, intentional or otherwise, are not great or that I disagree with. There's an old video by Jenny Nicholson where she talks about how a lot of Brad Bird movies are really into meritocracy and a few special humans, and like, yeah, they are, and I still fucking love Ratatouille. And I think all three of these assumptions on their own are wrong and often very conservative, but I could see myself enjoying a piece of media that makes some of them. Lots of media includes the theme that being a parent is in some way a rewarding and fulfilling experience that is good for you, and I don't mind that. I just got done finishing the rehearsal, a fantastic and absolutely buckwild show about parenting that kind of makes this case. But all three assumptions made, taken together, sort of create the perfect storm for an episode that argues for some really reactionary things. It advocates for a world where the lives of unborn creatures are inherently more valuable than those of the living, where to end those lives is so morally abhorrent that it must be preserved, even if the stakeholders feel their own lives would be put at risk in the process, and where babies are seen as a sort of moral panacea for all of humanity's worst attributes. All of these assumptions taken together could and have been used to build an argument for forcing people to be pregnant and give birth against their will. Taken on their best possible faith, it's very much possible that this was not the story the writers wanted to tell. The more I rewatch this episode and the more time I spend with it, the more I'm like, how on earth could you not realize this is what you were doing? But it's a possibility. The fact that a not insignificant number of people came out of the episode feeling like it was pro-choice is evidence of that. 
and taken on this good faith, I can see glimmers of the kind of story Harness may have wanted to tell. It's a story that's consistent with themes set up throughout the rest of the show. It's a story about peace, about choosing not to give in to fear and humanity's more violent tendencies. It's a story about coexisting with the unknown rather than instinctively trying to destroy what we don't understand. It's a story that I don't think this episode ever told. If they wanted to make this episode nuanced, they should have made it nuanced, you know? Make Lundvik an actual character and not just heartless, mean, babyless woman. Give Clara and Courtney some real opposition from a person whose choice we're meant to really reflect on and take seriously, rather than a character we're instantly meant to identify as the villain. Previous episodes have done this a lot better. Uh, look at episodes like The Christmas Invasion, where the head of government Harriet Jones orders the destruction of a retreating ship because it's perceived as a threat to Earth. It's a through line throughout the whole season, and it's interesting. Harriet's choice is generally understood as wrong, but there's a real dilemma there. She isn't just a one-dimensional cardboard cutout of a mean girl boss for the main characters to yell at. We can sincerely ask ourselves if the Doctor's involvement in that situation made things worse. Or for that matter, have there be actual consequences for Clara violating humanity's free will? Something interesting other than just the egg hatches another perfectly identical moon exactly where the other one was. Bad political subtext aside, it's just a shitty way to write a moral dilemma. Here's one side where literally nothing wrong will happen to anyone at all, and here's one side where you do a fucked up murder. Wow, great trolley problem. You nailed it. <laughs> This episode sucks, even outside the abortion stuff, but the fact that I can see small fragments of places it could have been improved kind of makes it fascinating. This episode aired nearly a decade ago, and I'm watching it now in a very different world than the one where it was released. Millions have lost their right to bodily autonomy, something that has already had devastating consequences. I guess in the wake of all that, part of the reason I keep coming back to this dumb Doctor Who episode from 2014 is that I think the story it may have wanted to tell is the kind of story we could benefit from, now of all times. I want to see stories that challenge our tendency to respond to the unfamiliar with aggression and fear. I want to see stories that respect the fact that humans sometimes have to make complicated decisions, and that paternalism and condescension in the face of those decisions is unhelpful. I want to see stories about empathy and fear told well. I really wish we could have gotten that. This video talked about a lot of stuff, but was also especially about writing and storytelling and what happens when certain underlying ideas perhaps unintentionally get communicated. If these are particularly interesting to you, you might like Sam from Wendover's class on persuasive communication. It's really interesting and in-depth, and goes into how human psychology works, how persuasion and communication and analysis all go hand in hand, and how to get at the deeper underlying arguments and things. It's also just very entertaining, and I'd highly recommend it. Sam's class is part of Nebula Classes, a brand new part of Nebula. You've probably heard me talking about Nebula a lot, since it's the streaming service I'm building with other creators like Big Joel, Philosophy Tube, FD Signifier, Maggie Mayfish, and more. Nebula, in general, is really cool because it's a streaming service with over 14,000 thoughtful, cool videos that give us the space to produce content that might not be best suited for YouTube. I myself have a whole other video on there that isn't on YouTube, and many of the videos you'll find here have sort of extended-ish versions with clips I can't include on here. And now, with Nebula Classes, you'll find a whole bunch of exclusive classes from creators who know a lot about their fields. That's people like Thomas Frank, Amy Nolt, the aforementioned Sam from Wendover, Georgia Dow, Polyphonic, and more. We've got a new class dropping every week covering all kinds of really cool ground. We've got talk about musicals, outdoor camping tips from travel experts, how to sue like a lawyer by Legal Eagle, tips on producing a pop song, and more. And of course, by signing up for classes, you'll also get full access to Nebula and all the exclusive ad-free content by fantastic creators you can watch there. And it's only an annual price of $149, that's the price of just a couple coffees each month. But if you visit nebulaclasses.com slash you can sign up for just $119 per year. But wait, you may say. 
I've seen some of your videos already and I'm already subscribed to Nebula. How do I get access to classes? Well, if you've already subscribed to Nebula using the Curiosity Stream bundle in some of my previous videos, you can upgrade for just an extra $89 per year. Once again, just go to nebulaclasses.com slash Sarah Z and take advantage of the promotion. I can't recommend it enough. On top of a big thank you to all my patrons, I'd like to thank my $20 plus patrons. Thank you to RJ, James Dugan, Queen Autumn Ween, Sophie McLaughlin, 124MM10, Benson Lai, Clayton and Claire Page, Roman Antonacci, Evan Griff, Zach Radley, Simon Welsh, Robert Valentine Allen, Robert Gelhar, Lachlan Newport, Yehuda Katz, Vostok, and Jacob Furtado. I also have one person who'd like me to shout out a charity instead. I did Planned Parenthood for the last video, and in the spirit of that and this video's themes, I'd like to shout out the Center for Reproductive Rights. They work with the UN in several different countries to advance reproductive freedoms, as well as fighting for contraceptive access, childbirth support, prenatal care, and more. They do some really important work, and I can't recommend supporting them enough. Hey guys, uh, I hope you enjoyed this video. I just wanted to give a little message um, that the Respect Women Juice mug that I've been drinking throughout this video has been like sold out for a super long time. Um, it's back up. I believe you can either order or pre-order it now. So there's a merch link in my description. Um, so I've got the Respect Women Juice mug here. You can also get the Young Dumb Full of Libel iconic Homestuck mug again now, as well as some pins and stickers. So if you would like to show your swag, respect some women, commit some libel, uh, you can just click the merch link in my description to do that.